But the production is not too much, honestly, uh, this year. So probably we will do a very sh small uh, green harvest, not so, so so strong. That I prefer, honestly, because uh, that's uh, I, I prefer that when the, the the vines are have a good balance already on the beginning, so we don't force the too much the the, the vines. That helps to do a more balanced wines. Okay, very good. Of phenolic maturation. All right. Well, let's uh, before we talk about the wines, let's talk about your history. Uh, Elvio Cogno. Yeah. Tell us, tell us uh, about that. What uh, when the winery was set up? Tell us about Elvio. Invitation, Tom. I am uh, always uh, excited to to stay to to meet you through Zoom and meet your uh, your uh, follower. And uh, Elvio Cogno Winery, uh, born in Novello in 1990 when uh, my father-in-law Elvio Cogno uh, left Mar Marcarini Winery in La Morra and bought this property uh, in, in Novello and it was a challenge uh, a challenge time for us because after a long history in La Morra uh, for 40 years uh, my father-in-law at 60 years old uh, restart completely uh, the activity, the, the, this job, and uh, make a challenge because we came uh, in a novello that was uh, at the at the time was a little bit uh, unknown uh, area uh, or less less uh, less important uh, in, in for somebody, but he knows perfectly what we get, we we can get here because he born in Novello and know very well the potential of this crew. So we came here with already with a, a lot of expectation. In fact, Ravera in the years became more and more famous and more popular thanks to, to our jobs and also other producers then follow our, our example and our, uh, our uh, road. Right, right. And then Novello for people that I know a lot of the people that are watching today are very familiar with the Barolo area, but for those people that do not know Novello, you're pretty much all the way southwest in the Barolo, so correct? Right, right. We are a little bit more near to the mountains, a little bit uh, in the south uh, uh, zone of the Barolo area. Novello is the, is the fifth co larger commune of, for Barolo production in, uh, in, in, in the area. Uh, of course, the most important area are not too big. We have Ravera, others, other crew very important, like Panerole, like uh, uh, Bergera. There are three or four uh, Sotto Castello di Novello. Yeah. Very good, good, good crew. But Ravera, honestly, today is one of the most represented crew of the, not only of Novello, but of, always also for uh, the interior barrel area. Uh, here is uh, have a good elevation. We are around uh, three, 380 meters above the sea level, and uh, that's helped to do a wine is always very linear with a good acidity, with a great energy. Wines that uh, uh, show beautiful acidity and uh, a, a, a minerality and elegance. That's thanks to the, the cooler uh, microclimate that we have in the night. In fact, in the 2017 vintage, uh, that was uh, one of the warmer vintage, we are very, very happy of the result that we can get in 17. I, I just put up a picture of the of Rivera. So tell us, that, that's your winery right there, right? The yellow structure. Yes, we have uh, uh, 11 hectares all located around the farm uh, that, and, we, and uh, the house uh, in, on the top. Uh, this is 300 years old that we restored uh, in 30 years slowly, but uh, with great uh, love about the, the, the landscape. In fact, the UNESCO get uh, an award uh, to maintain the landscape original of the area. That is, we are very proud about that. Uh, <laughs> mostly of the winners are in South Exposure, as you can see in this picture. Uh, in, in front of the, of the house, we have uh, the Ravera Barolo, and uh, in the middle, uh, we have Cascina Nuova, and uh, in the right side, you have uh, 
uh, Vigna Elena is a hundred percent Barolo Rosé Clone. So okay. this photo, this this are all your vineyards here. I mean, up, up, all, up, but up. Uh, in this photo you can see the south face of, and the most important Barolo vineyards of El Japonia. Okay. And we're looking north in this photo, correct? North is behind house, direction right. La Morra, that is north. Exactly behind my house, the straight, you have Castiglione Falletti. You can see the castle yeah. behind the, the tower, yeah, the brown yeah. tower, yeah. yeah right. and way, way up on the hill there, it looks like, is that the Anno d'Alba? In, in the top, behind the Castiglione Falletti, you can see the Anno d'Alba. Yes. In the okay. All right. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, it's been it's been almost two years since I've been there, so I'm I'm getting very jealous looking at this picture, but I remember it very well. But yeah, it's in a beautiful area. So let's we'll come back to Rivera and and Barolo in a little bit. But you are also very well known for white wine called Nascetta, and if we can talk a lot about that, because I, I tell us about Nascetta and and I know a lot of it is grown in Novello. Where did this wine this grape come from? Why is it? Uh, yeah, uh, if you can, if you can, per, uh, if I can say that El Yoconio uh, have for me a couple of pre-made, a couple of uh, important uh, things that we have done uh, is uh, Nascetta, Baro the Barolo Ravera, because uh, before us nobody write Ravera on the labels. And uh, Nascetta is indigenous grape, is a variety of Novello, is a white wine very, very old, uh, ancient uh, variety that uh, thanks to us, uh, since 1994, we uh, say to the abandon. And, uh, and in the years, uh, uh, these wines became more popular and today there are around uh, 35 producers in all the Lange area. Of course, Novello is the, the, the town uh, where this grape born originally. And uh, th there is a DOC, uh, DOC of uh, Lange Nascetta del Comune di Novello. Yes, that, I, uh, as you can see, I, I put up the label, the bottle there, and I, I wanted to comment on that. Yeah, it's, I, because originally you, you could not label it that way, right? It was just a, a Lange Bianco, correct? But now it's... In the beginning, it was a Vino da Tavola, on the beginning. Tavola. Okay. One table since uh, 1994 to until uh, 2000. Uh, four, because 2004 we get the DOC Lange White, and after this date uh, we arrive until 2010 uh, with the Lange Nascetta del Comune di Novello. So with a long, long road, long, long travel to arrive at this at this point. So was well, a there, I, I would I would say when you change rules in Italy, it's never a short road, is it? It's yeah. always a long road. <laughs> was a uh, really hard. Uh, hard uh, hard job uh, with passion to save a grape honestly it was not so easy uh, to do this this but uh, because we are in the barolo area and the most wine most important wine are, is the barolo and uh, we have uh, another white in a region of of uh, red red wines is not easy to 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 promote and uh, uh, but uh, we believe a lot in this uh, variety uh, since the, be in the beginning uh, because uh, this is a white that aged really, really well. And uh, on, in the last uh, years, I taste uh, the, the first vintage that I produce and the wine absolutely great. So and what finish was that? Sorry? You said the first vintage you produced. What, what, when was the first vintage? 1994. Wow. 1,000 bottles. Okay. I tasted the recently 2003. That was not an easy vintage. No. Uh, it was a very warm and uh, remember that yes. very torrid vintage. And yes. uh, and the wine was so beautiful and uh, today uh, and it was a little bit more uh, power, of course, but uh, a wine uh, with a very golden color today, but a lot of minerality and a lot of freshness still uh, that show. Uh, a, car a reasoning character a little bit. Uh, of course, in 2003, we still do, we, we have still done malolactic fermentation today. We did 
didn't uh, we, did, we don't make any malolactic today for have more acidity but uh, also in that vintage the wine are still uh, still good still very very good it's good I, I think that's something that surprises people that's like i've seen comments from even a lot of articles from some wine writers about you, know, you have to drink this right away and it's not as you said you, you're drinking wines that have been over 20 years old um why why do you label your wine? The grape is called Nascetta, but you you label it Anascetta. Why is that? Yeah, because the that is a is a, is a tricky because uh, when uh, when we released the Nascetta on the beginning, the the, the name was Nascetta, and then uh, but it was a one table, and the the grape was not authorized variety at the moment, so nobody can say nothing. But once that we scripted this grape, this grape on the national list, uh, Nasheta, we cannot write the name of the grape on the label, and we put an A in front of the for don't change the name. You know, <laughs> we change a little bit the name. We put an A, right. Anasheta. Right. But in past, this is, is uh, in the past this variety called Nasheta or Anasheta. This is not a problem for for that. Okay. Anyway. Is that still the rule that you, a producer cannot list nasheta on the label or? Yeah, yeah. Nasheta, uh, other producer. Anasheta remain our original name, understand, from the beginning. Uh, I, I don't want to change again about the name because I, I don't blame you. <laughs> okay. And I'm curious on the name of the grape. Is that a local dialect? Yeah, but uh, I have a manuscript of uh, 300 years ago that uh, the, the grape called Anasceta. Okay. Brought brought Anasceta. And, and where does that name come from? Is that a local dialect or is that? Oh, well, this probably is dialect is uh, in, on, I spoke uh, with the ancient people of Novello. Somebody say that is or comes from a uh, Sardinia, Nasco variety, but uh, that is not true. We, we oh, okay. make DNA, DNA of Nascetta is completely different from Nasco or Vermentino. So probably is a mutation. Somebody said that is a mutation of Nebbiolo, but uh, that is, we are still studying. Okay. Well, well the word Nasce itself, N-A-S-C-E is first in birth. is a, uh, is a, is it a dialect name? Is the original? Of, nobody knows exactly where this name come from. Okay. Okay. Un gran misterioso. Okay. And misterioso, uh, come il vino. Uh, also, as the wine, is a little mystery. Yeah, right? Yes, yes. But it's a wine that is uh, full of surprise. Uh, and uh, honestly, we, we need to, to drink this. We drink this wine too early. And in fact, this year I postponed the release of the new vintage. I release. Uh, uh, 2020 only next year okay. uh, because uh, this wine needs a, at least uh, one year in bottle before to start to have a, a beautiful uh, uh, evolution okay. uh, of, uh, of minerality, savory, uh, this character. On the beginning is too is a semi-aromatic wine, but it's too um, a little bit too fruity, fruity character, a little bit tropical character that I, I prefer. Okay. After some years, that became more mineral with more acid, more linear wine with more tension. Is more uh, white flower, acacia flower, a little bit uh, aromatic herbs like sage, rosemary character. And I understand you. Not only age it in steel, but also it spend a, a, little, a small percentage of the time in barrels as well, right? In large right, barrels. right. Uh, since uh, 2018, we change a little bit uh, the, the. Okay, in, on the beginning we use 30% uh, uh, fermented in barrique, but then we change and uh, stop it to use barrique until 2010. And today, in 2019, we restart with uh, with the barrel, but big cask. Because right. today I have um, more production, and I can use a big cask. Be be because before, if I use the big cask, we need to put 100% in wood, and I don't want to do that. Uh, I want to do 30% in large barrel, and today I have, but I produce around 18,000 bottle every year. So that is a, we have a good quantity. Uh, 
for uh, mm -hmm. age in, in fermented in bar and big cask, Slavonian oak. Okay. And then we abandon a little bit the, the maceration, the cold maceration, because during the cold maceration, we have seen that we, re, we lose a little bit the acidity. And we are doing a cold stabulation that is a little bit different. Cold stabulation means to press the juice, to press the grape, take the juice, put in stainless steel, full stainless steel tanks, and keep this juice without ferment fermentation for uh, around 10 days. And every day we make batonage to, to take in suspension the sediment uh, of the juice only. And uh, these methods help to extract aromas from the, the pectins of the grape. And then, and then uh, after this phase, we start the fermentation with, uh, with uh, increase the temperature. And you get the same result, but you don't have a salification of the grape and of the acidity and precipitation okay. of the acidity. Because during maceration, we have a salification of salt comp composition that going down in, and the loose acidity. Okay. I know, first of all, first of all let's, let's put up a picture here of your vineyards. Is this on your property or is it outside your property? Is it, is it oh, it's, it's my property. This is uh, the winner of Machete is, uh, uh, is the it is the long winners uh, near the tree around the uh, under the road. Uh, the vineyards behind the tree. Uh, or in the, tree? the northeast exposure. Yes. Okay. And these are the vineyards in that photo. They're behind the trees or they're in front of the tree. Right, right. Behind that is the, my tree where I get the truffles. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Do you hunt for them yourselves or you, you find do? truffles there? Yeah. Not me. Many people just come there with the dogs and take my truffles. And okay, I, I say, please get me one sometimes. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> leave, leave, leave a few for me. Right. Okay. Um, and just a, a quick question. I, I know you don't make Arnais, but a lot of people are familiar in Piemonte with a white called Arnais, and a lot of it's from. Or Oero district, which is across the river, but how would you compare uh, Nascetta with Arnais? Mm, honestly, if I need to spend uh, a lot of time behind Arnais, as I have done for Nascetta, is not my goal. Was was not my goal because okay. uh, I want to do something special for a Barolo producer and uh, especially for El Bioconio that have a lo long history uh, with the Barolo. So I want to do something special, and Nascetta for me has a more uh, mm, complexity. Of, okay. And uh, this complexity you can you can get from uh, a very special uh, variety, and uh, like Timorasso, for example. Uh, when we started to make Nascetta, me and Walter Massa was the beginning, starting the same time to do to save the, the this grape. And, uh, but Walter Massa uh, that doesn't, pro don't produce, doesn't produce uh, Nascetta, um, Barolo. So uh, for him and for uh, his area was a little more easier to promote this, this, uh, this wine. And uh, they was a, with, a big with, team. With, with Walter Massa, you're talking about Timorasso. Timorasso, right, right. Exactly. right. So on the beginning, me and Walter Massa was the, the two supporter. Okay. Of these two varieties, uh, and a little bit the father of these two varieties. It's an interesting story, and well, I I'm glad that you've stuck with it all these years. And I tasted it in 2019, and you're right; it's a very nice, beautifully balanced wine. There's a lot of that, some of that tropical fruit and melon and things, but it's nothing like it's going to be in about four or five years. Yeah, I know it's going to be just a much more complex wine, and it's perfectly lovely right now, but. I know from tr drinking some older examples with you. And I think now start to have this minerality, if you take, because, uh, but just now start to have this uh, character that I want to find in some Chenin Blanc or uh, uh, this, this kind of wine, a little bit of Riesling, uh, but not a, a little bit more notes of, uh, uh, today is, is more citric wine, you know, uh, but right. in- I would agree. In the years, probably became uh, absolutely much more complex. Yes. Well, I 
but I am really happy about 19, honestly. Yeah, well, everything, I, that's another question I have more well, before I go to Dolcetto here, but from the wines I've tasted so far, white and red, which are limited in availability right now, but mm -hmm. everyone in the Long Gate tells me 2019 is just an outstanding year for every, every varietal. Yes, yes. Dolcetto was, uh, is a fantastic vintage 19. I love it. Uh, is let's, a let's, very... let's talk about Dolcetto. We are we we want to talk dolcetto, right? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay, dolcetto. El Bioconio has a, a long tradition uh, with the dolcetto, and we are one of the wines that uh, was a little bit underrated uh, uh, in general uh, because uh, the people uh, are more interested to taste Barolo wine. But dolcetto is uh, our traditional variety, and uh, El Bioconio always take uh, care about this variety. And uh, the point that in the 90 years, the Dolcetto became always more and more power and uh, because they want to show the, to produce, the producer want to show that it was a, a very important wine. That is an important wine, but is not important to exasperate the body and the power. And in my opinion, Dolcetto needs to remain a, a very drinkable and young, uh, in young time, and a very fresh and fruity wine. It's a very difficult wine to do, but uh, the reason that it's not expensive don't means don't, to, don't uh, put a great effort to make a great wine, because they put the name on, 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 my, on, the, on the label of my brand. It's very important for of me. Course. But I've, and, uh, I've, and Dolcetto is a very fruity wine. Very, it's important to have a very beautiful harmony uh, of the acidity, freshness, and purity. Because Dolcetto often is not really clean. Of, often is a little bit reductive character. Right. And uh, the point that uh, I like the Dolcetto that show this beautiful uh, fruitiness and freshness that come from the, this variety that, uh, and what is really important that uh, don't make a, a dolcetto too tannic because the tannins of the dolcetto, the dolcetto is a tannic wine. Uh, uh, if you increase too much the body and to re sometimes the dolcetto is, uh, has a rustic tannins and that mm -hmm. uh, don't helps to have a drinkable wine. Yeah. And uh, for this reason we do, we do a shorter fermentation around four or five days only okay. right. uh, because we take the color immediately uh, in 36, 48 hours, we have all color available. And then we can continue to ferment without skin. That don't mean to do a uh, simple wine, but a wine with uh, more elegance, more finesse and not too hard tannins, especially in vintage like 19 or 2020 that, that are beautiful vintages. Yeah, I've tried more than a dozen, actually quite close to two dozen examples in the area of the Lange of uh, Dolcetto, as well as some from Doliani. And it's, 2019, I think, is just one of the best vintages I've had for Dolcetto in the, in the last you know, decade. And um, your, yours, I mentioned, you talked about, you know, it's, it's a wine to drink fresh, but I tried it yesterday, the 2019, and I, in my notes I put down, I said, you know, in a few years, it's going to reveal even more complexities. And I said it would peak out in about maybe five or six years. And I may be short on that. It may, it may taste out, you know, beautifully, uh, maybe even in 10 years. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And I, for me, the wine, uh, for me, the wines in general are, when are good, are good always on the beginning, during and after. For me, it's difficult to say if a wine on the beginning is not good to say, ah, wait, because then became good. Exactly. Well, especially from a producer like you who's been doing it for a while. You know, I mean, as you said, you wouldn't have your name on the label if you didn't think yes. it was a good, good product. So a quick question. I'm sure some people want to know the soils where Dolcetto was planted. Are they, how different are they from soils for Nebbiolo? Yeah, a little bit, yes. I but what is important, the microclimate and the exposure of the dolcetto uh, needs to have uh, cooler exposure. In past, there are some uh, dolcetto that are planted in south face. That is very difficult today, especially now that we have a, uh, a global warming time that is increased the temperature and we have a wine too overripe or too heavy. 
that is, uh, we lose the characteristics of Dolcetto. Dolcetto is a wine that uh, we can, is our daily wine in Piedmont. Right. Um, but daily wine, for me, is a perfect wine for aperitif with salame, with uh, uh, many kinds of food, but a wine also to drink a little bit cooler, chilled uh, in summer. That I, Nadia, for example, my wife, he, she loves uh, drink dolcetto, not white, not bollicine, not sparkling wine. Right, right. right. She loves dolcetto because she feels well, you know, after the stomach is okay, no problem. Okay. It's very, it's a very opti op optimum wine for, uh, for the, for a aperitif. I, I remember reading and talking with other producers, but back, I think in the 1930s or so, you used, you used to be able to go to the pharmacy and they would have a, a, a medication that was made with dolcetto, correct? Would right. Tell you right. Something. Yeah. yeah, dolcetto because the acidity is very low and they call dolcetto seems a, a sweet, a sweeter wine. Uh, the point that dolcetto, the doctors in the past say, are you drink dolcetto, you have a problem with stomach because the acidity is very low, is a very, uh, is a medical wine. <laughs> there you go. I, yeah, I, I wish, I wish yeah. we could have 10,000 people listen to that, hear that because it's like, I've always thought that Dolcetto needed its own public relations firm, you know, because it just, it's a wine I love. It's the first wine I fell in love with from Piemonte. And as you said, it's so easy to drink and it's so delicious. And yet, because it's the name sweet, people think it's a sweet red and it's not. So it, it but uh, the other thing too, just think, talking about Machetta and now Dolcetto, I've been doing these webinars for more than a year now. And I think this is one of the benefits that you, I, I never even thought about with a webinar, but we get a chance to spend time talking about wines like this. You know, if we just did an article or someone did a presentation in, in, you know, in front of an audience, it would just be, you know, Barolo, for example, or if you're in Tuscany, like Brunello or something. But so it's nice that we get to spend time on wines that aren't as, aren't as so famous, shall we say, as, as the other wines. So, but good. Let's move on quickly to Barbera. You make two different Barbera. Barbera yeah. d'Alba and then the yeah, yeah. Uh, prefiloxera. Uh, with the Barbera prefiloxera, yeah, this is the point and our goal. So we produce two Barbera. One is more, uh, that is Barbera Brico dei Merli, uh, the first one that is uh, a little more classic Barbera and more traditional because it is Barbera d'Alba. Uh, Barbera today is a wine that uh, are very popular because uh, thanks to Giacomo Bologna, years ago that when safe uh, the Barbera from uh, the uh, a little bit the was the a little bit the wines a little more more cultivated in the area and sometimes you drink difficult Barbera too much acidity and then Giacomo Bologna when you decide to put in wood uh, change completely the characteristic of Barbera and the Barbera in the years became more popular and this was back I think in the late late 1970s correct when Giacomo Yes, yes. Uh, and his winery for people that I'm sure probably know this, but it's called Braida today. His, yeah. his children run the winery. So, but, but yeah, it, it, I know it was an everyday wine. It was sort of, people used to tell me kind of Coca-Cola or Pepsi, like, you know, just, you know, an everyday wine, nothing special about it, but now it's things have changed. It has become special. Barbera is, uh, Tom, uh, as you know, perfectly, uh, is a wine that uh, is a full body wine. It probably is the most international variety that we produce in Piemonte. What means most, interna most international variety? Because the Barbera is the grape that adapted a little bit better of the situation that is where is where he's grow, where where he grows. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, Barbera is planted uh, in many places around the world. You find Barbera in California. You find Barbera in Australia. Yes. Is like is a little bit like Cabernet that is adapted at the situation that he he found uh, it find uh, and uh, Barbera but Barbera in the years became uh, too inter for me is too much uh, international character uh, we cannot understand exactly what we are doing especially in the ninety years we produce Barbera with a lot of wood rich very rich full body wines. Uh, a powerful wine that ages really, really well, uh, reducing always too much of the acidity. 
Uh, in fact, the, the, the disciplinary of the Barolo, of the Barbera will change. The, the rules are the, by law change. The acidity is became 4.5 minimum of acidity. That is ridiculous for me. Uh, is not in my 30 years I, I have never seen a Barbera with acidity less than 5.5 right, right. or six six per thousand is the limit and this is the the characteristic of Barbera is acidity and no tannins this is yeah. the characteristic of the grape and the Barbera for this reason age really really well in wood in fact Barbera this kind of Barbera Brico Merli comes from a winner at a 50 years old very old ancient vines and uh, age one year in barrel uh, fermentation in stainless steel for uh, uh, 10 days when it's very dry and then we move uh, in wood uh, malolactic fermentation in stainless steel this is a full body wine but what is important for me that barbera continue to 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 show the characteristic of barbera that are freshness and acidity Without this characteristic, uh, we are drinking something good wine, but honestly, it's not too much Barbera. I, I want to feel terroir and understand that it's Barbera d'Alba uh, and not Barbera d'Asti or Barbera, the other, Barbera from California. I love uh, show Barbera of Conio, okay? And uh, that is my, my goal, to, to release wines that are expression of the, the variety. Well, I, that's one of the things I've always admired about you and about your wines, the way you make your wines, is that they do have that, that anima, that sense of place, and, and they do have great varietal purity, varietal character. So, um, yeah. right, they don't taste like they came from anywhere. They, came, they taste like they came from a specific uh, yeah. vineyard or place. So let's talk about you also make this very limited quantity of this pre from Barbera, which yeah. is maybe uh, the only example there is. I'd love, love to hear more about this. Uh, we have two Barbera because uh, before I bef before 2010, uh, I I rent a Barbera Prefilo a uh, Winners in La Morra in Barry. Barry is a region uh, on on the top of La Morra area, right. uh, more than 500 meters above the sea level. A very cooler place with sandy soil. And uh, this, this grape, this uh, winner is very, very small, 3,000 square meters. And I produce just uh, uh, 1,500 bottles. And uh, what, what, what sort of yield do you get from these vines? Must be very small. That is uh, under 20 years old vines, uh, not grafted, original. Uh, and that is uh, a museum to see. Uh, right. Right. It's uh, fantastic to see. And the result is a wine completely different from the other Barbera. Uh, I don't want to say that is much better than the other, but are two completely different wine that in blind taste, absolutely, is not so, so easy to say this is Barbera d'Alba, uh, because uh, the characteristic of this wine is more silky texture, in my opinion, a little bit more uh, spicy character, a little bit more pepper, black pepper note. It's a little bit like Grenache and... Uh, and Syrah, depends on the vintage. But, but this Barbera, this Barbera ungrafted, so it's so unique, uh, so special, and uh, for me is uh, a gift for the wine lovers that want to have uh, a, new, a new experience drinking Barbera d'Alba. Yeah, I, I think it's great that you continue with this. Um, I, I, do you know of any other producers that have a pre phylloxera Barbera or do you, do you know one? My, I, this is a wine dedicated to Elvio Conio. I want to dedicate this wine to my father-in-law. That's great. Because uh, when we left Marcarini, he produced another wine, pre that Dolcetto d'Alba Boschi di Berri. Right. Uh, probably you have tasted uh, this wine, Tom. It's a lovely wine as well, right? And uh, when we left Marcarini, I it remained always in my heart uh, this, uh, this, this hall, you know? Uh, that uh, we we miss this wine. So when I have a possibility to rent this winner, I immediately do have done this wine for uh, for memory, the job of my grandfather-in-law. Well, that's great. A, a technical question: Are these older, you know, over a century years old, yeah. um, ungrafted vines? Are they more resistant to disease? Because I hear a lot about 
disease. Yeah, they are very, of course, uh, they are very, very old. And so, so every year we lose, uh, we lost some vines every year, but we do, we do, we take uh, propagine, we take a cane and put in the soil and make a, a new vines. And then okay. we cut when they grow, uh, we make the, the new roots, you know, okay. you, and you do a new son of, and that is uh, very important to, to maintain the, this variety, in these winners in the year, in other more years. Okay. Of course, every year it became more difficult because it's very, very old. Right. And, and, and in a typical year, when is the harvest for the pre vineyard as compared to the other vineyards? For uh, it's, uh, probably it's a little bit post later than uh, the, the Bricomerli. Uh, probably is uh, well, three, four days after. Oh, only okay, only a few days. Okay, yeah. all right. Yes. Well, let's uh, let's move to Nebbiolo, which you're you're very very famous for, and of course it's this is the Lange, but yeah. Nebbiolo um, is uh, uh, Montegrilli. Montegrilli. I take the bottle. Nebbiolo. Uh, Nebbiolo is a wine that uh, we have though a uh, a beautiful. Uh, I would say a challenge again, another challenge for my for me, because uh, we introduce uh, whole cluster wine a little bit, thirty percent, and uh, a little bit uh, uh, maceration, uh, carbonic maceration, for have uh, more fruitiness. In fact, we don't. For me, the Nebbiolo is completely different wine to the, to the Barolo. There are some uh, producers that may, are doing uh, um, are doing Nebbiolo that seems a Barolino, uh, too, too near a Barolo, uh, aged a little bit in wood. I don't want to do that. I want to uh, I want to do a wine completely different from the Barolo. Uh, so only stainless steel. So the result is a wine with great purity and freshness, uh, very uh, pure character of uh, white strawberry, a little bit uh, white pepper and character, and uh, seems a little bit to Pinot Noir style, but it's a wine that have a lot of uh, complexity. It's not a simple wine. Uh, and uh, I love this wine also with drinking with the fish. I like this wine. Uh, it is my, this was a, my, a, my wine during lockdown. Me and Nadia every night, we drink right. a bottle of this wine. Okay. It was so, so uh, pleasant wine. Uh, I, I believe in this style. Uh, and in the future, I continue absolutely. The people are uh, happy of this, my new, new Nebbiolo version. Okay, let's talk about another you, example. Do you try this wine, uh, Tom? Yes, I did. Yeah, oh. and it's very enjoyable. And as you said, you don't age it in wood. So I'm noticing more producers yeah. doing that, but it's very elegant. I think the thing about Nebbiolo that always surprises people who don't know it that well is how elegant the wine is and how feminine, if you will, the wine can be. It has a lot of charm to it. It's, it's very approachable, even though it ages for such a long time. It's yeah. uh, it, it, it's a lovely wine. A really. bit the color during the, with the with the right. carbonic maceration, but that is not a problem for me. I don't want to do very dark wine uh, like in the night years when the wines are uh, seems uh, uh, very very dark. Okay. No, I it, I did taste the wine, and enjoy it very much. So, and uh, I've got, got some older vintages that uh, you know I love one of these days. So. Before we talk about your Barolo, and you have four of them, you have a very yeah. distinct, unique program with Barolo. You also make a Barbaresco, and I'm always fascinated with producers such as other Barolo producers, such as Cristino Odero or Luca Corrado and Vietti, who also make a Barbaresco. Uh, I'll, I'll put up the shot of the photo of the uh, bottle here. It's yeah. from the Bordini MGA, and that's in Neve, correct? Right, right. Now, and this is a 2018 vintage, which is Barbaresco is always released one year before Barolo. So tell us about the 2018 vintage. 
Yeah, we started to produce Barbaresco in 2006, and uh, because uh, we need to do another experience with the Nebbiolo uh, uh, variety. So I love Bar Barolo, of course, for sure. Uh, is our, in our DNA there is Barolo, but I love to do an, exper es uh, an experience with another great Nebbiolo from Barbaresco. And uh, Barbaresco remain a wine that uh, have a lot of elegance, a wine that uh, is a great character. And the Bordini, you have a possibility to rent a winners in Bordini. Uh, I produce around 6,000 bottles and uh, that is a wine very in, produced in very traditional way. Of course, we are not easy for us to manage uh, this wine because we need to do outside the Barolo area because we cannot, uh, it's not allowed to produce, uh, the vinify the Barolo here. We have another cellar there in, okay. in Neve uh, and we, we need to, to vinify there. And, uh, but I love uh, this experience and uh, I am really happy of the result that we, we especially in the, with the, the new release, Vintage 2018, that is, was a very rich Barbaresco and uh, with a lot of balsamic character, uh, good tannins, uh, but very, uh, very complex uh, Barbaresco. And uh, Bar Neve, of course, if compare other, other communes like uh, Trezo and Barbaresco is probably is a more elegant character of the Barbaresco area. Okay. Well, I uh, I found other 2018 Barbaresco from other producers to be, this is an, an excellent vintage, maybe even outstanding. And some producers said it's not as powerful as, for example, like 2016, but in terms of elegance, it just is a unsurpassed, beautiful vintage. And uh, before I give you my notes, just it should be reminded to everyone watching is that, again, this is, you mature your wines in the large cask Livonian oak. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, not only to me does that give us a wine that has a lot more expression of terroir, but also a lot more varietal purity. And I think, you know, while there are some people that use bariques, I, I'm trying to remember a quote you told me one time about how you just hated bariques or you, you, you had made a, a little fence at your winery out of out of bariques or something, you just it, yeah. The barrique you are do the, the, the defense. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I think you said that. that that's, yes. I, think you said oh, that. I, I, I used the barrique in past, but uh, honestly, I was a young when I I started to to do this job. I was young. I want to do experiment, and I remember in that years that when we started in 1991. Um, Everybody used barrique, you have Rotto Macerato. Uh, right. And, and uh, my father in law said, no, no, it's not necessary to use this, these things. Don't worry. I, and, but I was young, I wanted to, do, to try, you know? Sure, sure. And, and because that is normal, for, uh, especially for, uh, one, for, one, for young people to discover something new, or to, to show something special. But in the end, honestly, my father-in-law has completely agree with him now today after a long experience now i say yes you i prefer this the char the characteristic of the grape and don't lose with the other other flavors through the wood or the toasted character exactly well i'm in total agreement with you and i, I can't imagine this wine being aged in a week it would totally change the character of it yeah. and um I, I just I just don't think you'd get the, the charm that this wine has. But I tasted this yesterday and we before we started today, when we talked for a few minutes, I said uh, this was an outstanding wine. Um, it has a lot of grace, a lot of charm, and very elegant wine, beautiful varietal character to it. And um, I, to me, this is one of the finest reds from Italy I've had this whole year. Really an outstanding wine. Yeah. The best. The best wine for with the truffle is Barbaresco. There opinion. you go. There you go. So, but if, if, if people think about Elvio, Elvio Cogno, they think a lot about Barolo, but don't forget this wine. I haven't had every vintage you've made, but this is the finest that I've had from you. And it's, you know, I'm, you know, can get another bottle or two and lay them away for a long time. So gorgeous wine. So let's, let's move on to Barolo. And when many producers have wine from different communes and different vineyards, you have 
four different Barolos, but all from the same MGA from Bravera. So I'll put up some photos here. Let's talk first about your Cascina Nuova. Thank you, Tom, to introduce this, this aspect that uh, for me is really important, for our family is really important. Produce four Barolo for the same crew is not absolutely easy. I can imagine. But to, to, to keep, uh, to, it's need to work in different way, keep separated the wines and keep, I want to show the different aspect that comes from the, the clones of the Nebbiolo uh, that are Lampia, Michetta and Rosé and uh, show also the different uh, single plots that uh, we had because the, uh, the, the, the soils change. Also in one kilometer, you can have this many different characteristics of the soil. And in this way, you have absolutely four different Barolo. The first one, Cascina Nuova, is produced with the youngest vines, around 20 years old. Today are not too much, young, young, too much younger, but 20 years is still uh, start to be a very, very important. Uh, and uh, Here's a photo of the, the vineyard. Yeah, yeah. Cascina Nuova is uh, the central uh, vineyards. Uh, is, uh, is Lampia, Michette, uh, and a little bit Pico Tenner, that is another clone from Val d'Aosta, is, uh, is a selection massal of, uh, of Nebbiolo. And uh, this is a wine that uh, I, I decide to do for the people that want to understand exactly what is the Barolo and don't need to wait 20 years before to drink a wine. Is a wine that uh, don't stay on the shell and take the the, the powder, but uh, is a wine for drink and for also the, right. the people that want to enjoy a young Barolo. And uh, in fact, we we produce a wine with a lot of freshness and and flower character, and especially Seventeen is a vintage that have uh, beautiful elegance. But before to talk about the Barolo, I would like just to say two words about the vintage, the 217, that is the new, the new vintage that we released, the last, the last vintage that we released. Uh, 17 is comes uh, from after a, a fantastic vintage like 16. And for this reason, uh, started uh, uh, with, uh, was a little bit, uh, Everybody started to talk about the vintage like a, a, min, a minority vintage right. uh, for many reasons. First of all, was a, a, a warmer vintage than 16. But uh, honestly, uh, when I release my wine, I can say that I would like to have every year a vintage like 17. Because probably some of, of you forget it, what, what, what are the, the vintages, which are the vintages in the 90. We have done two good vintages in 10 years. Today we are doing eight, vin eight great vintage in 10 years. Uh, so, and 17 is a vintage that they want to do every year. And of course it was not so fresh and power like 16, but 17 was a vintage very elegant. And the tennis are not so over, are not overripe and not dusty tennis like uh, nine, for example. Right. We have, uh, uh, vintage is a little bit warmer than 17, that uh, cooler than 17, that was a little bit more overripe in the uh, in past. Uh, but uh, was of course after a vintage like 16, uh, was not imagined that 17 was was a little bit uh, underrated vintage. Uh, I in 17 I have done uh, a new. I became more extremist. In my in my vinification about the Barolo, I have uh, introduced a whole cluster of wines, and uh, in uh, Ravera, especially in Barolo Ravera, uh, with all oldest uh, wines. And there is, and I am really happy to have this freshness and this uh, complexity in this vintage. What to save the vintage in seventeen was the greatest course of temperature that you have in September when uh, you have uh, a very cooler night. Otherwise, it was became warmer than 2003 in the end. Right. Not warmer, but drier, drier. Okay. 2003. Because the precipitation in 17 was very, very low. Yeah, it was, really, kind of, it was kind of a drought for about 
two, three but months. But in, in September, we have a beautiful cooler night that that semi completes the vintage and uh, you have a beautiful phenolic maturation. In fact, the tennis of 17 in general are very, very fine. And, and I, I think that this wine can age really well. Yeah, well, I like your point about, you know, how you like 17 because you're right. The, the early word on this was that it was going to be a, you know, average vintage at best, maybe even not a very good vintage. But your wines, as well as other producers I've tried, you know, they're, as you said, you can't have 2016 every year, a big powerful wine that will age yeah. for 25 years. But um, these wines are very round and very elegant. And I yeah. think that's what people forget. And that's, that's especially yeah, if you have a restaurant and you want to- Override, not mature, you know? Right, right. Okay, well, let, let's talk about the, uh, the, the Rivera Barolo. I'll put up a shot of those fingers, so. Yeah, Rivera is uh, our flagship wine is, uh, is uh, the first Barolo that we, we produce in, in, in here in this area. Uh, this is Lampia Miquet. The vines are 60 years old. And uh, this is fermentation around 40 days on the skins, very extreme, uh, long fermentation and 24 months in large barrels, La Okay. Uh, uh, this is introduced whole cluster wine here, 30%, that uh, we, we find uh, in this wine uh, more uh, spicy character, a little bit more white pepper notes that show this uh, more elegance and show this uh, great complexity. In the in the background of the wine, I, I, we're looking at this picture again of, of the Rivera vineyard we showed before. But um, Rivera is actually in the middle under the house. That is Rivera. Okay. Where you you see the tra, uh, helm on the tree on the end. You have yes. a, in the middle. Yes. That is the oldest the vineyards. Okay. How how old are these vines? 60, 70 years old. Yeah, okay. very very old. All right. And um, you mentioned whole cluster Nebbiolo for a small per per percentage of the wine. Is that? 30%, I, I introduced the, and in 19, we increase a little bit more the whole cluster. So I am crazy a little bit, I know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh. I, I, I'm, I became older and uh, older, my palate is more exigent. I don't know, it became more difficult, my palate probably. I want to find, uh, more uh, more new new um, I would say energy. I want to find energy in my wines, and what is really important for me that when you taste in blind my wines, you do, okay, ah, this is Cogno wines. That is right. this, this is the characteristic of Cogno. That is this is my goal, my, my what I'm looking for. Okay, well, I, I I think that's important. I think without you know, having your hands all over it, I think just to have a little signature, as you said, people can recognize your wine. That's a great thing. Well, you, and when you said you're crazy, I'm, I'm assuming not not many producers use whole cluster uh, when they make Barolo. I know that probably there are somebody that I, they don't prefer taste whole cluster wine or I don't know. But in blind taste, uh, I taste I have tasted some some uh, 17 wines and uh, on El Bioconio show this beautiful freshness that for me is really important, especially in a vintage like uh, 17 that was uh, a little bit uh, warm. Exactly. Well, let's go to your third Barolo, which is called Brico Pernice, and you released this a year later. The current vintage is not 2016. So tell yeah. us about that vineyard and about, I'll put up a photo here, and also about that vintage. Brico Pernice 16, because we, this wine is come from the oldest uh, parts of the Ravera Cru, uh, is the, the core of the Ravera Cru. Uh, this is 100% Lampia clone. Okay, and, and what's the difference? What makes Lampia different than? Lampia is the, is the most popular yeah. clone of, of the Barolo area. 80% uh, of the Barolo that you try is come from Lampia. Okay. Uh, uh, Lampia is more is good. I have a good product. Is good, good production. Is a, and is a compromise. Uh, not too power. Not too elegant. Is a good compromise. The, the harvest is the first clones that we picked during the harvest. Okay. Then we have Miquet, and the last one is 
Pinot Rosé. Okay. A bit of a picture of the vineyard here. This is. Yeah, this is beautiful. Uh, this is the Bricopernic Hill, right? Yeah. Part is mine, part is from of Vietti. Okay. Half is mine, half of, of, of is from Vietti. Um, Vietti is part, the Vietti part is on the right, isn't that correct? On the right, right. Yeah, I remember I visited the you pointed mine, that out. And the top is mine too, okay? okay. And how old are these vines, is it 60 years old? 60, 60, 60 years. That is, that is uh, the microclimate is, uh, here is a little, a little bit warmer than uh, in the other part because it's more protected to the, the wind, from the wind of the mountains. Okay. Because in front there is my house and the hill of my house that protect from the wind, the cooler wind. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here uh, we have a lot of limestone, a little bit less sand. So here we produce a wine a little bit more classic, a little bit more power. Uh, that um, uh, for this reason, in fact, we we age one year more this Barolo in wood. This wine aged 36 months in large barrel. Okay. I produce 5,000 bottles only. But you, 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 do not, you do not label it as a reserva, correct? I can, it's not write reserva, but if I want to write, I can do. I don't care. I don't write reserva at the moment. There it is. I get it on the screen here, okay? Yeah. And yeah. so, and it's the 16 vintage. And tell us about that vintage very briefly. I know it was a really- It is a fantastic wine, my opinion. That is a wine that I am uh, proud to produce a wine like this. Uh, you find the more character of, uh, of uh, underwood or wet leaves, a little bit tea leaves. It's more uh, absolutely very complex, very, very complex. Uh, when you walk in, in, a, in a forest, when you end wet, uh, and the crash, this right, the, the, the leaves, leaves the, but you right. breathe this this these notes. Okay, you know, you interesting. A touch of tar, a little bit too, a little bit uh, also um, notes of uh, liquorice, a little bit, but it's very com and fruit of course, for sure. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very polyedric wine. It, it, it's it's beautiful and. Uh, Let's wind up. You said you're very proud of that. This last wine we're going to talk about, you must be extremely proud of because it's called Vigna Elena, which is named for your daughter. This is the Vigna Elena is a, a wine that dedicated to my daughter, Elena. Uh, and the, the little try that uh, I became a grandfather. So in October, so I am uh -huh. so happy. So Congratulations. I, and and the, the little dry in there is, is one that she did. She was what, three years old? Is that correct? When I was three years old, she drew this label. And this is come from a very special vineyards in MGA that called Vigna Elena. If you go on the MGA, you find Vigna Elena. It's one hectare, 100% Rosé clone. Okay, here's a shot of the vineyard here. Right. I understand that you planted this vineyard the year she was born, is that correct? Right, in 1990, 1991. And what was the decision to plant only rosé clone? Yeah, because Elvio, on the beginning, want to have all three clones to do a Barolo or a Vera with the three clones be blended together. But then in 1987, we take separated and we have seen this beautiful result, a wine with a lot of uh, uh, roses, dry rose petal flower notes, uh, very Pinot Noir character, uh, very elegant, but, but not a wine with the uh, energy too, again, uh, different from the other Barolo, very different. Uh, and today probably is the most iconic uh, wines of El Bioconio, iconic wine of El Bioconio. But, and the production is very, very limited around 3000 bottles. This wine is a reserva because age six years, for, for me it's reserva. Also, uh, Bricopernice could be a reserva, but uh, I, I, the mention reserva, I decide to, to use only for a Vigna Elena. Okay. And I, I just, I know that one of the people watching today is a friend of mine, Kathy Corson, who's a winemaker in that valley, and she's going to visit the Long Gate next year. And yeah. uh, which is, I'm going to, first, I'm going to put up a shot of the, uh, the label here, because maybe you couldn't see it with the, with the, uh, with the light, you know, that was coming on here. But here's, here's the shot, a better look at the label. And a little drawing that Elena made, a beautiful yeah. label, Reserva, 
And the current vintage is 2015, correct? Right, 15 now, yes. What was the, the difference with 15? Uh, more, a little bit riper than 16 uh, is uh, very characteristic. Uh, the characteristics the, of the dry rose petal notes, uh, very um, juicy wine, very juicy wine, uh, very approachable already, but can age well for sure. But normally, Vignera age a little bit less than Ravera and Bricopernice. But uh, because Rosé Clon for, uh, pot has a little bit less potential to age for, for my experience. But uh, probably you have, don't have time to, to keep too much time because you, you enjoyed before. I have 2010 at home. I said it the last time yeah. when COVID was over, I would open that. So, but I, I, I know that's got to be in good shape. But I was mentioning also about, uh, I said one of the people watching today was, Kathy Corison is a winemaker in Napa, I'm just saying, especially to Kathy, but to other people as well. If you've never tasted this wine, this is a must, simply because I don't know of anybody else that makes a Barolo that's made 100% rosé clone. And as you can imagine with the word rosé, it really does have those, those floral perfumes. That, that there just, are, uh, in future, there are probably other producers that uh, will do Barolo with uh, or Barbaresco with rosé clone. I know that other producers are planting this, this variety now. Okay, interesting. So anything else you want to add? Because we're, we're just about out of time here, but it, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. You're a very engaging speaker. I mean, we, we've known each other for a long time, so you're easy to talk to, but you, you're always full of passion talking about your wine. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for you, to you and to your wine law. Your follower, your all wine lovers that know Elvio Cogno wines, and uh, of course, I looking, uh, I looking forward to see, see you and uh, meet you soon as possible yes. in Piedmont. Fingers yeah? crossed. I, I, I'm hoping by October or November. So it's been almost, it's been almost two years since I've been there. So and uh, I hope to see. Wine, you. But it's not the same here as it is with you. Yeah. And I want to, I want to travel in the U.S. also when it's possible. To meet you there too. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Grazie. Buona, buona, buona ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Grazie. Ciao a tutti. Ciao a tutti.